before bringing any tech to the table, try to really understand what your team needs. And you are not, as an operations leader, going to be the one who writes the requirements. Your team is going to be who writes the requirements. Welcome to Secret Ops, the podcast uncovering the world of operations, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Ariana Cafone, and today's guest is Oshwine Kerskanskaive, head of operations at Reframe and co-founder of Operations Nation. Now, if you have not heard of Operations Nation, I mean, welcome to the party, folks. They are a community-powered knowledge base to help operational leaders do their best work. The last five years, they've been doing that with a Slack community, with different resources, with a course for operators. And right now, we are partnering with them in the October International Ops Festival, which is running from October 16th through the 20th to talk all about operations. As you know, my favorite topic. So today we talk with Oshwine about her journey through operations and things that she's learned along the way, which I gotta tell you, I definitely took some key takeaways that I'm gonna bring not only into my work life, but my personal life. So I hope you're gonna get a lot out of it just like I did. Uh, again, everything is going to be linked in the episode description if you want to check out the International Ops Festival and, of course, more about Ashwine. All right, let's jump in. So thank you so much for coming on to Secret Ops. This is not only a treat because we get to dive into an incredible seasoned operators experience, but we also get to talk about Operations Nation, the International Ops Festival, and everything that is going behind the scenes to make this happen. So thank you so much for being here and for taking the time. Thank you so much, Ariana. I am really, really thrilled to be here. Uh, Very excited to talk about all things operations. Yeah. Well, let's start with your journey because we talked about this. Every operator's journey is different, which is the best because then we get to see how you sort of made your way into this industry. So give us give us your path. What did that look like? Where did you start? So I love this question and running a community of hundreds of operations leaders. I ask this question every week. Mm. And so I think about it a lot and and I'm always trying to answer it for myself. And to be honest, my answer uh, for how I got into operations or why I got into operations is different probably every month. <laughs> and so I was thinking about it earlier and I thought, you know, my, my answer is going to be something like, oh, I just, I just fell into operations accidentally because... Honestly, I I always thought I did. Um, And that's also the answer that a lot of operations leaders that I talk to give me. But then I started digging a little bit more into my childhood. And honestly, I think it is my dad to blame (laughs) or thank for for, for, for getting me into operations. Because... Okay, now um, we got to know why. We got to know why. (laughs) So... I grew up in Lithuania, so I'm Lithuanian. That's why my name is so unpronounceable for for many people. We're gorgeous. Yes, stunning (laughs) name. Yep. (laughs) And I grew up in, um, you know, my family, especially my dad. um, He was very entrepreneurial. And he's also the type of person that he wants to get value out of everything but he also sees value in everything. And he is always seeking to be helpful and useful. And I grew up him always questioning me. So, you know, with whatever you do, okay, you're watching this movie, what value are you going to get from it? Mm -hmm. You're doing this thing. um, How helpful is it going to be to you? So I think I developed the mindset of always looking for value in whatever I do and because my dad was entrepreneurial, he was uh, setting up his own business when I was just 10 years old. And oh, obviously wow. he had me help um, because I wanted to deliver value and uh, I wanted to be helpful. He was like, okay, so you know, can, we, can you help me um, do the X, Y, Z? So whether it was preparing shipments or you know, folding brochures or data entry, whatever it was, I was always very happy to be there to help because it was very validating for me. I was I was there being useful um, and I was also developing my skills 
And it was really boring admin work. It was like the back office work that like, <laughs> totally. I think my, my parents were just like happy that I was doing, yeah. but I was not. But as a kid, if you're doing a, an adult thing, it is so cool. Even if it's oh God, the most yeah. boring thing on the planet, right? Like you feel like an adult or you're like you're playing at being an adult. That's so funny. Exactly. Yeah. And and for me, it was very, very empowering from early on uh, because I was participating in this family business. And then, you know, I was thinking about why, why I'm relating this to me getting into operations. When I was a kid, you know, kids say a lot of stupid things. And at some point, I proclaimed to my parents, I had this epiphany and I was like, you know, dear parents, I really love this really mundane, boring admin work. And I do not remember saying this, but my parents do still remember that I said this. Oh my God, this is brilliant. And I was like, well, but what do operations people do all day? And what other people think we do is this really boring admin work. We don't think so because for us, it's really interesting. Um, And yeah, there are some really boring admin tasks that we need to get out of the way. But I think that's what really got me into operations, Um, this childhood experience and this need to be helpful, this need to provide value. And yeah, I definitely have to thank my my dad for that. I guess has been a thread throughout your entire career. Can you just give us sort of that rundown? Because it's really impressive to sort of see that journey in the roles that you've taken on and then ultimately how you're now at Operations Nation. Like how was that whole professional journey for you? Yeah. So, um, you know, I studied Japanese and then I didn't finish it. Uh, I decided to uh, move to another degree, um, fine art, which, um, so I studied print and digital media. Um, So it was fine art for digital media. And, uh, and I graduated from that. And then I thought, well, I, I'm not entirely sure that I want to be an artist. And I thought, well, I don't really have anything serious on my CV. Who is ever going to want to employ me? Um, at that time, I found an accidental, a very accidental internship um, at the first ever startup that I have worked at called Songkick. And um, I was helping them out with recruitment process. And again, going back to, to to delivering value or being able to deliver value for them, um, they hired me because I had some prior experience in recruitment agency where I worked throughout my studies and learned a ton of stuff about how to run a temp desk. And again, it was very, very fast-paced, very, um, very tense operationally. Mm. And, um, you know, from then on, actually at Songkick, my, my title wasn't operations anything i can't remember what i was called i think it it was more of a project uh, project associate project assistant um but from then on i thought i need to get something more um serious on my cv um i decided to apply for a master's business um and i was uh, really happy when i got into innovation entrepreneurship and management uh, master's mm-hmm. program at imperial college London Business School. So um, that was very exciting, very mind bending for me after studying three years of art, um, go straight into a one year intense business degree program. And then, um, and then what happened after my, um, my master's. So again, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. I was exploring some, you know, big four consultancy firms, went to an open day, you know, bought a suit for that occasion that really did not sit well with me. Um, (laughs) Then I looked into maybe I wanted to do advertising, uh, checked out a couple of uh, advertising agencies. Again, I I, I thought um, that wasn't the path that I wanted to go in. And accidentally, I met a couple of a couple of guys who were just setting up their own company and they were Lithuanian. Um, so that was like a slight connection. I didn't know that from before, um, but they said, um, hey, we're we're doing a startup. And uh, this is the app. This is the first version of the app that uh, we have created. Um, do you mind being our alpha tester and giving us some feedback on it? And I agreed. And I, I gave some really seriously not great feedback. <laughs> <laughs> because I was like, well, you asked me to be honest. 
No. Were you just you, honest, like brutally honest about the feedback? Is that what it was? I was brutally honest. And, you know, <laughs> when you take an Eastern European, when you take Lithuanian, we're normally brutally honest with each other. With, with each other. And I think that's exactly what they wanted to hear. And, um, and then they were like, hey, you know, do you have anything after? Um, do you have any a- anything set up after your uh, you finish your studies? If not, then do you want to come and and, and work with us? Mm. And then I said yes, sure, um, would be happy to to help because I had um, nothing else lined up. And when I joined them, we were trying to figure out exactly what I was going to do and what my title was going to be. And that's when they said, well, we're going to give you a title operations executive. I had no idea at that point what operations meant, but I was just happy to get to have a role. And it was uh, a very exciting startup that was pioneer- pioneering um, selling digital tickets um, for all sorts of events, entertainment. And yeah, I was, I was just very happy to be a part of it. Um, and then my role basically was anything from office management to filing trademarks to setting up content teams because we had a lot of content going on um, to managing customer support uh, teams. So my role really grew uh, in four and a half years that I was at Wipeline. My role um, really grew very rapidly. And very soon I saw myself managing. Um, It was probably close to 30 people across um, for five different teams. And... Wow, that's no um, joke. <laughs> that's how I got into operations by accident. But then again, yep. going back to uh, to my childhood, uh, apparently I was always meant to be there. Yeah. When I've talked to any operator, it's always like somebody sort of shows you the title and then you're like, okay, cool. And then you really start to own the title. Like where I was the same thing. I sort of am like, I could do anything with the startup I'd started working with. And I got a director of operations title. And then you just realize that that is a big, beautiful sandbox to do all the things that you want to do with it. Um, And if you're curious and if you're always looking for value in things, that drives all of this, right? And then the cool part is we end up typically being managers. And then we try and instill all of those curiosities and all of those things into our team as well, which it seems after that first sort of, you you caught like a bug almost with that role (laughs) where it's like, all right, this is my happy place now. And then that became a thread throughout your career as you've done different things. So how did you get your path to operations nation? Because you definitely early, you early along the way saw that operations needs to become more of a part of the conversation. So how did that come to be as a part of your journey? Yeah, that is a, that is an excellent question. Because the first time that I got title operations, I had absolutely no idea what it is, what it is going to be. Um, you know, I, I, I had a class at university that touched upon logistics and supply chain, but mm. nothing more than that. Totally. That's what I feel like everybody knows that. Logistics, supply yeah. chain, warehousing, right? But the word operations, I didn't hear about either until I was in it, the world of business and doing the things. And then it's like, oh, there's so much more to this thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think maybe, you know, in the US, it's a little bit more sexy than in Europe, um, because <laughs> when I was looking for for roles, I, I remember, you know, uh, probably seven, seven, eight years ago, when I was looking for roles in the UK, I couldn't find anything in the US. Mm. Back in the day, I already had something, you know, a lot more exciting. But um, I think, you know, when it comes to when it comes to value and creating value with operations and uh, and also going going into why um, I co-founded Operations Nation, I think it came with the lack of resources and with a lack of understanding who I am as a professional. Um, mm. Because in the first five years of my career as an operations leader, I was alone. I was by myself. I had no other operations leaders that I knew apart from my boss, who was there for about a year um, taught me a couple of things that are still incredibly helpful to this day. But when he left, um, he was like, okay, you know, so you're still going to do your job as a head of operations, but as a VP of operations, I'm leading and I'm also handing you 
everything that I did on top of, of, of your role. You know, no big um, deal. <laughs> no big no deal. Big deal. <laughs> um, and it was really fun, but I was like, okay, cool. So how am I supposed to know when I perform well? Who is going to tell me that I'm doing a bad job or a good job? Um, and it was very self-led. And I think the biggest challenge that I had in the first um, five years of my career is that I didn't have anyone who gave me any incredibly helpful guidance. I mm. worked with amazing founders and they were great. Um, I worked with some incredible leaders on the leadership team. But when it came to operations and me defining what does it mean to be successful in all the areas that I was leading, sure, we had OKRs. And, you know, it was it's very easy to say, hey, well, you know, you're leading a customer support team. Uh, you're looking for customer happiness to be 10 out of 10 or for a really good FBS score. Um, but there's more than just that. There's a lot exactly. of, there's a lot unsaid that I think you know you want to have, but you don't know what it is exactly as an operator. Mm -hmm. And it's like almost like you feel like there's just pieces of the picture that you're not, you don't know you need to see yet that you then start to learn as you get more senior within and you get more experience within yeah. the industry. They're like, oh, that's the piece that I wish somebody would have helped me see sooner. I mean, I found mm -hmm. it and I found it eventually, but you know, it took a couple years. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't think it is isolated to, you know, only to operations people. I think anyone in their career would love to have a mentor or, you know, a coach that has experienced what you know, we have experienced uh, or we are experiencing at the moment and, 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 and really help us guide through things. But, um, you know, for me, it was the joy that I had when I first met another person who had the same title as me, head of operations. And I realized, hold on, why am I only meeting you five years into my career? Where are all the other people? Who holds events for us? What is happening? How can we learn from one another? Because you know, we, we met each other and we geeked out on so many things from anything from you know how to implement good benefits for your team to calendar color coding, that there was no topic that <laughs> left untouched. Yes. And we're like, okay, so what do we do? Um, you know, what do we do with this? Um, and yeah, you know, how can we, how can we make the life for operations people better? And that, that person that I'm talking about is Claire um, Samson and she is a part of operations nation community. And I credit her a lot for this uh, initial idea. We did not end up becoming co-founders. She's an amazing operator, an amazing community contributor. Um, but, you know, we had that conversation one, kind of wanted to do something together, but uh, never um, got another chance. Um, but and later I got another job. So I had my, you know, really amazing experience with Y Clan, where I grew as an operator. I mm. could really hone my skills and really make an impact. Um, and the company was acquired um, in the end and I was made redundant in the process and I needed to find another role. Mm. And then I felt like, do, do, I, do I know anything? Am I a good operations person? Yes. Oh my gosh, yes. I know that <laughs> exact feeling. Where you, Even if you have years of experience, you've solved endless yeah. problems, you've helped grow a company or team, whatever, it always feels like it's never enough. Like, do I know enough? Yeah. <laughs> to be able to speak about it from a level of expertise, right? Like, because it's that thing yes. that once you, when you know a little bit, you think you know a lot. And then once you actually start to open up the career of an operator, you realize how much you can know, and then you feel like mm -hmm. you know nothing. So that's I, I felt the same way when I started learning web development. It's like, oh, I know CSS, like I'm killing it. And then I learned JavaScript and I was like, I know nothing. And then databases. And I was like, oh God, you know, like each of those layers just made me realize how big of a, of a thing this could be. And I, I understand that feeling intimately. And so I guess part of the process was acknowledging to say like, actually, I do know a lot and I think I can help other people. I don't know everything, but I can pass this knowledge down of where I'm at in my career today to help others. Is that mm -hmm. right? 
Well, that came a lot later. <laughs> <laughs> that came a lot later. Um, honestly, I think that's where I am now and maybe where I have been for the last couple of years. But first, I took a big dip. Uh, first, mm. I, I thought I don't know anything. Um, I took a job at a company that was a marketplace, like my first um, a company that I was at, like my first company where I learned operations. But I absolutely failed to um, to evaluate how different this other marketplace is going to be from my first one because there was a physical product involved, and apparently, I, as a like, I, I did not know myself well enough to know that I just don't like moving from product from point A to point B. Oh, this physical is just, products, man. Oof. Now Ooh, and, I've been in that world. It's so hard. It's so hard. there's so much to it. It's such a it is a can of worms selling physical products. Every single piece of it is hard. <laughs> Especially for an operator. Yes, it is. And I think, you know, and then you start recognizing yourself um as a a certain type of an operator, a certain type of an, an operations leader. And then I started understanding that there's no, you know, one size fits all mm -hmm. that, um, you know, at some point. Um, so I ended up leaving that company fairly quickly after realizing that, but it definitely had a dent in my confidence. And I think mm. um, it is really important to talk about it because in Operations Nation community, there are so many people who are going through the same things, but um, they don't really want to talk about it publicly because they think that makes them seem underqualified or weak uh, or, you know, whatever, whatever the word Definitely. is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I really want to call out everyone who has gone through this experience of thinking that they're not good operations people or not good professionals. And I think, uh, you know, maybe you were just in the wrong place at the wrong time because I certainly was. Mm -hmm. It's and definitely a normal feeling too. Like part of being in any type of role, and this could be any role, you know, customer service, sales, operations, I mean, finance, there's so many different factors that go into whether or not that role is right for you. It's the industry, it's the team, it's, it could be where the company is located, it could be the types of things that they sell. And sometimes I think we, as operators, are very hard on ourselves. Our expectations are very high. We should be operating at the best of everything because that's kind of what we naturally tend to be as people. Um, but then there's a limit, right? If you actually aren't really digging the thing that you're working on, there's only so much passion that you can put towards that thing. And it does feel like you're failing, but in reality, it's just, this isn't the right fit. You know, this isn't the right size company for me, or this isn't the right role for me, or, you know, maybe this isn't, this isn't the right time for me to be in this role. It, it's not a personal thing that you're doing anything wrong. It's just a realization that you're having as to where you need to go next. Yeah. So I definitely have gone through that myself. It is hard though to get over that mental hurdle and to let go of any negative self-talk. Do you have any tips for how you were able to sort of process those things and move forward? Ah, it's It was a very long process. I think it's, um, it did require some therapy and some coaching both yes. at the same time because I was I was really um, not being easy on myself. Um, you know, it probably took me a couple of months to get out of um, of, of the pit that I'm yeah. not um, a great uh, operations leader and mm. uh, and kind of reinstate myself um, in the world of work. And so, one thing that I always say to my teams, um, especially when it is super fast and su super fast paced working environment and, you know, everyone thinks that the stakes are high, you know, um, the companies that I have worked at, lives did not ever depend on us. So whatever happens at the end of the day, uh, whatever you're thinking, it's okay. You know, people are interesting in that everyone is always thinking about themselves and there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone, you know, the, the, the nature of the humans is that we're selfish and that's absolutely fine. And everyone is only ever going to think about themselves first and probably other people later. So one tip that I probably have for other people is that, okay, it's fine, you failed, but 
why does it really bother you so much? You know, some other people probably thought about it. If you really care about what other people think, they probably thought about you for a glimpse of a second and then they started thinking about their own lives. So Definitely. you're not the center of the universe. It's fine. You're going to recover. <laughs> um, and I, th- I think a lot of my, a lot of my worry was initially what are what are other people going to think about me but also what am i going to what am i thinking about myself and yeah. um you know is operations a path for me so that second part was a little bit more difficult to overcome mm-hmm. um and the way that i started and and again going back to the value um my question was i you know i did not i failed to provide the value that i wanted to mm-hmm. for this company i wasted their time how can I recover from that, mm-hmm. right? And um, you know, the the thing that I started thinking about is how can I fix it? Um, how can I prevent it in the future situations in my future roles? And I started seeking more knowledge, and I started seeking people mm-hmm. that I could learn from. Um, I wanted to find some books. I found. Uh, I wanted to find some courses um, about operations, and I couldn't because there were nothing. There was nothing available. At the time so essentially there weren't resources out there to help hone your skill as an operator you did find some but what made you want to start operations nation and i guess to sort of take a step back for those listening who have never heard of operations nation what is that community so operations nation is a knowledge sharing hub for operations leaders or anyone who is on a path to become an operations leader. And um, me and my co-founders, Shardin and Astrid, we started Operations Nation a couple of years ago. And um, it was beautifully formed from two communities that um, me and Astrid uh, were running and Shardin was running independently. And um, so going back to the reason why we started those communities is that uh, we saw that for ourselves or for our peers. There were absolutely no resources available. And it was also very difficult to meet other people in operations because all the events, at least in London, were for product managers or engineers or CEOs or founders, but nothing was for operations people. And we felt that, you know, a lot of us are just sitting there in our companies tasking 24 seven, leaving the office at 9 PM, uh, when everyone is already in the pub for five. And we thought we really need to break this mold and just give ourselves a better chance to surviving, but also thriving as operations leaders. And so Astrid and I, we started up stories. Charlene started um, cohort, COO ward um, at the same time. Um, and a couple of years later, the three of us met. And after uh, a, a very long, heartfelt conversation, we thought we are working for the same thing. We are working mm. for this um, improvement of lives of operations people. And we thought that we should combine forces and start working towards the same vision and mission together. So that was a couple of years ago. And um, what we have, so what Operations Nation is, uh, we have a Slack community, um, a thriving Slack community of now nearly 2,000 operations people. Wow. Um, it's amazing. It's, so it's, exciting. It's really great to see all the chatter that is happening in the community and all the people helping one another. It's, 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 it's really heartwarming. Mm. And um, we have a lot of community members take uh, initiatives and contribute to all the knowledge that we're, we're creating for one another. So whether, uh, you know, they're helping. Oh, can we talk uh, about the book? Oh, yes. Oh my God. Yes. The book is so excellent. So I wanted to touch base on this because I, I wanted to mention how incredible I think this is that you all are doing. Do you mind just breaking the book down for people, sort of the concept behind it um, and then the, the format of it? Because I think that's the really yummy piece that I love. Ah, that is a difficult question, actually. Um, it's uh, it's Charlene's um, baby. It's my co-founder's baby, the book. And it's something that she wanted to write for a very long time. And one of the most important 
yeah, one of the most important ideas behind it is that, yes, we wanted to write a book, but do we have enough um, knowledge and expertise to do it really well? Mm. Or, you know, should we um, collaborate with others who have much more to say on these particular topics? And um, then we ended up going back to our community and saying, hey, do you want to co-write this book with us? And it is now a really beautiful collaboration. So again, we didn't want to write the book all at once. Um, and we're releasing it chapter by chapter. Uh, we're now four chapters in. Um, we have just released the last one. And we have many, many more to go. So whoever wants to see what we're writing about and download the latest, um, the latest chapter and all the previous ones, they can go to Operation Station website. It is free to download. Um, it's an incredible resource, and I, I really think the energy of Operations Nation is so infused in this in this resource, in this book, because it is so community-generated. It's also incredibly engaging. It's beautifully designed, so it's like really gorgeous to sort of mentally process the information. And it also f solves a problem when I talk to operators who are earlier in their career and they're like, where do I go? <laughs> where do I go from here? And I feel like having people who have walked the walk be able to talk the talk in that book is so refreshing. Um, especially because in a lot of other industries, I think that some people become an expert and they sort of maybe did the thing for a year and then they're like an expert in it. But these are people who've done it for a long time, are still working as operators. And so you get that really in-depth experience in every single word that they're talking about. Um, so like, obviously I'm crazy about it. I think it's so excellent. Um, and it does just say to me how powerful your community is, that everybody is coming together and saying, yeah, let's support Support this mission. Let's help others. Let's educate. Let's empower. Let's like, let's get it moving. Let's make it accessible for anybody who wants to view it. That is such an amazing thing that you all are putting out there outside of all the other things you're doing, including the International Ops Festival, which is when this episode is releasing. So can we talk about that as well? Because you've got some brilliant speakers. You've got everybody coming together. You know, why a, a festival like what what about this sort of is driving this initiative forward yes so we are incredibly excited about the operation of operations festival and what we did for the last couple of years is um you know just one or two day conferences and this year we thought we need to finally start doing what we always wanted to do and not only to showcase all the amazing operations leaders that are in our community or even outside of our community, but we really want to bring everyone together because um, I think the underpinning reason for it is that operations is not seen as sexy. Um, it's not. It is, <laughs> you know, it, is, it is so sexy though. Like it is so slick and cool. But we need a rebrand. We'll put it that way. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need a rebrand. And I think, you know, it is, you know, sexiness of operations is one thing, but the importance of operations and, um, you know, the fact that you absolutely cannot scale a company if you don't have your operations in order is another mm. one. And I think, especially now, like over the last couple of years or like even the last decade, the world has become so complicated. There are so many tools that are coming out all the time, new, um, new, new softwares, new systems that everyone is trying to, um, to implement to help to run their companies. Um, yeah, there's so much more competition. Um, mm. And the only way that companies are going to be able to, um, to scale and stand out is through operational excellence. And who is going to deliver that operational excellence if not operational leaders within the companies? And I think, um, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, operations is becoming more and more celebrated. Mm -hmm. And we have absolutely loved to see um, how many other communities are popping up around the globe, how many podcasts are popping Yay. up around the globe how many <laughs> other people are talking about operations and um you know ariana you are one of them um you are championing this uh 
you know, that you're waving the flag of operations. I'm trying. But... I'm trying. We, it's, and I like get so intense about this, but I we talked about this too. Operators work behind the scenes. They are so much of the time invisible and their work is so important. And I am really tired of that being overlooked or being the first to get cut or the first to be misunderstood. And it really takes us operators to like get into the spotlight a little bit and talk about the things that we do so that others can understand it, right? Like it's ultimately our responsibility to do it. Um, we also have to get over our hangups in kind of taking up that space to do it. Um, but without that piece, we're, we're gonna always be having to answer the question like, what is operations? <laughs> and yes. I wanna just, I wanna get that question, you know, I wanna get the answer to that question out in the world so no one needs to, to I don't know, feel like it's just process or it's just supply chain. It's so many more things. It's the backbone, it's it's the operating system, it's, it's how you move a business forward, how you make innovation come to life. Um, Clearly, I'm passionate about it, but uh, I appreciate y'all being a part of that international, creating the International Ops Festival too, and bringing all these communities together so that we all can be aligned in one mission moving forward. It, it's actually quite an operational thing, which is let's get all of these, <laughs> let's get all of these things aligned so we're all moving in the same direction and bringing in our own special kind of magic and our own special energy to the to the pie because every community that is involved in the festival, has their own sort of slice of the operational pie and Operations Nation is kind of holding us all together, which is absolutely stunning. Yeah, we hope to do that. No. Oh, you definitely will. And if anybody's listening and they want to see what the Ops uh, International Ops Fest is about or Operations Nation, you can go to operationsnation.com. We've got everything on there that you can check out. Um, so definitely, definitely check out all of the resources, all of the events. There's virtual ones too, if you're not based in London. Um, different locations around the world are hosting events too. So absolutely check that out. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't pick your brain for some tips and tricks. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure that any operators or potential founders or people who are listening and they want to bring operations mentality into their life, get some things from your brain. So the first thing is if we go into the trifecta, people process tech. I'd love a tip or a trick from each. And let's start with technology since we were just talking about that a little bit. From a technology standpoint, in your experience, what is a consideration that you're always sort of putting at the forefront of your technology decisions outside of the value add? Because I think that's always going to be the first kind of filter of any of these. Yes, I think the main principle with any sort of tech is that less is more mm. and that whatever tool, whatever tech you bring to the table make sure to use 100% of it, not just 5% of its capabilities. Try to yes. really understand it. Try to really understand how to use all of its features. Try to, before bringing any tech to the table, try to really understand what your team needs. And you are not, as an operations leader, going to be the one who writes the requirements. Your team is going to be who writes the requirements. So if you're running a customer support team, if they're looking to get um, you know, CRM in place or any other system that they need, go to someone who is working on the front line and ask exactly what it is that they need, what it is that they're looking for. Um, I think uh, there is slight um, challenge always with people who are working on the front lines, um, who are working um, as, let's say, customer support agents and uh, operations associates even um, at a more junior level. And I'm saying this because I was that person. It is very difficult to phrase um, what problem are we trying to solve. Mm -hmm. I think where our minds always go as operators is to look for a solution. So sometimes when we're asked the question, so, you know, what, what tech or what tool, what system do you need? Uh, we're like, okay, so we needed to have this feature without asking the five whys, what is it that we are really trying to do? <laughs> and what is the outcome that we need to see? So, yeah, I think for me is what, when it comes to tech, 
um, less is more. Try to really understand what is the outcome that you need. And then whenever you find the tool uh, that is going to be helpful with your problem, when you implement it, try to use all of it. Don't just um, use 5% of it and mm. get another tool that would be solved with a feature on the first one that you got. Yes, I, I see that a lot too because people are looking for unicorn platforms, right? Like most most of the time, a platform is not going to solve all of your issues exactly how you want them to, but they might have a feature that will get you ninety percent of the way there instead of having to integrate a new tool and take on the added cost and then have to figure out all the data integrations, right? So having to Think about that initially and the why behind it is really important. That's such a good tip too, even for myself. I think sometimes when you get a tool, you sort of want to check the box of like, okay, we're using this tool now, but it's really about learning the tool frontwards and backwards where you know every single thing that it can do and how we are and aren't using it. And that is a responsibility, not just of operators, but anybody who uses that tool. Um, it sucks to learn new things sometimes because it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the most important thing. I also love when people who aren't operators learn the tools because they're the ones doing the job. So then they can understand how to apply it in creative ways that might not even be in our realm of thinking, right? Because they're doing the, the work on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's a consideration too. But that's such a good point. And I'm going to take that away into my work, which maybe connects to, you know, people, right? People is kind of the tangliest bit. It's also the, my favorite bit of operations. So what are some tips that you've learned in managing people within the operations of a business? Ah, such a great question. And such a hard one. <laughs> and, and, and a really difficult one. Yes. Yeah. I think when it comes to people who are working in operations, you know, a lot of people say that operations people or as operations people, we have no egos. I think we have massive egos because, <laughs> you know, when you take an all hands meeting and, you know, the CEO mm. says, Hey, we have this really difficult problem and, you know, who is going to solve it? And then, you know, you have a room of hundred people sitting there quietly, not really, you know, look, try to look away. And there will be one operations person in the company who will raise their hand having absolutely no idea how to solve this problem yet but they're going to be like hey i'm going to go for it i'm going to solve it um yeah and i think in a way we think that any job that no one else is doing is our job and 99.9 mm. percent .9 is kind of true because this is how so many operations people describe their roles so doing everything mm. that no one else is doing which is uh, I really, I really hope that we will erase this from our vocabulary at some point soon. Um, but we also have a lot of confidence in our ability to actually solve the problem, even if we don't have the skills. Because mm. deep down, we know that we are great problem finders and problem solvers, and that you know, no matter what, we're going to get there at the end. So you know, I think we have really good, uh, really big egos, um, but they're very well hidden and very well managed. Um, and <laughs> when That's it comes to that. <laughs> it's so true too it's so true it is that i've been in so many rooms or meetings where somebody has a problem and nobody's responding nobody's like taking the torch up and then like you sort of wait until you know you're going to get the look that's like, hey, this is this is your <laughs> thing now. But you're right. There does have to be that level of confidence, maybe stupidity, maybe courageousness, <laughs> all of those things mixed together to say, yeah, I'll give it a stab. You know, there has to be that willingness there. And in a very contradictory way, it also hurts when you can't figure something out. Like it, yes. like it pains me when I can't figure something out or when I have to admit defeat. Like this integration isn't going to work or – it's actually not smart to do it this way because it's going to take longer to automate this than if you just press the stupid button. You know, like there are those moments where, you know, your ego is saying, I got to take a stab at this. And then the after effect is like, oh, damn, that was not, mm -hmm. that didn't, that didn't work out. But that's also part of yeah. it too. Like, I guess we do have to be willing to fall on our face as operators and maybe just be less critical when we do because it's kind of part of the job a little bit, right? We're always doing things we don't know. And we have to yeah. learn. Yeah, exactly. And I think we we need to be gracious about, you know, when we fall flat on our face and, you know, it's fine. We're going to get up and walk away and maybe, you know, cringe a little, uh, cry a little <laughs> for a bit, but it's fine. We're, we're, we're going to 
you know, get up. But um, yeah, the reason why I was talking about um, our big egos is that sometimes as operations teams, we have so much on our plate and mm. operations leaders are also very good at saying, hey, yes, we're going to solve this problem. Uh, and then, you know, come back to our team and say, hey, well, I have just taken another extra project for us. Um, and we all very well know how overworked and tired operations teams can be. So I think my biggest lesson when it comes to people and specifically operations people is to think twice as an operations leader before you raise a hand and take on another problem. Yet, yes, it is going to be feel, you know, you're going to be feeling very, you know, ecstatic when you're going to solve it and help another team. Um, but I think one very important point that a lot of heads of operations are not doing for themselves is making time away from busy time to focus on strategy. So mm. maybe my question is not not so direct into you know what what tip can I give about people, but it's you know try to focus on developing your operations team, try to make some time for yourself, and not take on every single other problem of the company. Try to think about how to prioritize your time better and spend the time on being more reactive than proactive. Spend that time on strategy. That's a really good point. I think the I was very much a yes person always. Part of that was like I'm a recovering perfectionist, people pleaser, all those things. But I think also you do feel like as an operator, if I don't solve this problem, no one else is going to solve this problem. And that's just not true. It is okay to not always put your hand up. It is okay to be quiet and it's okay to give yourself space or protect the space that you have to do the deep thinking. Um, it's also the thing that like, if you're constantly checking boxes, it feels good, but it doesn't mean you're moving the dial forward. So you yeah. have to make sure that ultimately the work that you're doing is moving the team forward, the business forward, the operational foundation forward. It's not just checking a box as good as we as good as it feels to check a box. I love a check a box, but like, it's just, it's not the same and you have to recognize it and then be able to manage that for yourself, which yeah. I guess let's talk about process. Um, because process mm -hmm. is important, but it also can take over everything. <laughs> so how, how would you recommend people think about process within operations? So I'm an early stage oper operations person and I am all for documentation of a, pro of, of a process or anything for that matter. Documentation matters a lot. But when I think of a process, especially in a fast growing business, it will keep changing all the time. It will need to evolve all the time. So the way that I think about a process, I will probably document the, the rough um, corners of it. But... Um, I want to make sure that I can change it anytime. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, again, go back to the um, to the tech principle. Um, I also want to make sure that the process is created by the person who is in that process mm -hmm. day in, day out, not by someone far removed from the leadership team. Um, yeah, everyone in operations loves a process. Um, but I think, again, sometimes you have created this beautiful line, you know, from A to Z and you're like, well, I really don't want to change it or I already have this tool or, you know, this automation took me three days to figure out. And I think sometimes we have unwillingness to throw things out that we spend so much time perfecting. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably one thing to say about this process. And then again, go back to another tech principles. Do you really need it? Mm. Um, why are you thinking about creating this process? Are you sure that after you have worked on it, the outcome is going to be what you need? Or is it better done by you know creating something else or maybe removing it instead of adding um, something else on, on top? So it's, um, and yeah, I think the principle is less is more and you know flexibility is key i think adaptability is key we've talked about this 
and obviously with Operations Nation, this is an important piece, but mentoring, um, mentoring others within the field is key to growing what we do and again, creating this beautiful community. So how has mentoring factored into your early days in your career and how has that influenced you as an operator now yeah. in, in your life? Yes, so 100% could not agree more that mentors and having someone to learn from is incredibly valuable. I think, um, you know, earlier in my career, I think in the first probably five years until we founded the community where everyone started naturally mentoring one another. So for those, those first five years, I felt very lonely as um, mm. as an operations leader, and I thought that I need to figure things out for myself, and no one can help me, and that is just so not true. Mm. Um, and then when we uh, came out of the community, it was really beautiful to see the mentorship. And again, I am a big believer that mentorship doesn't need to be, you know, senior to junior. So for me right now, I have um, someone that I talk to every now and then, and she's 19 and she's mentoring me on how to approach their generation because I have absolutely no clue. So I think, uh, you know, mentorship is incredibly important. And um, for me, one of the key people in my operations career is my current boss at Reframe Technologies, Jeff Shapansky. Um, yes, so um, he also goes by tall Jeff because he's incredibly tall. <laughs> and so I was very lucky to meet him in my previous company where he was my COO and he taught me so many things. And I will share one of the lessons that he taught me um or maybe not a lesson just, just just a concept i guess about operations we were talking about how operations is all about putting out fires and he was like hold on it's not true yes we are going to be putting out fires a lot of the time but really good um companies who really value operational excellence and really good operators they should strive for building the house with fireproof bricks and mm. installing the fire sprinklers and you know making sure that the uh, fire blankets or whatever they're called are you know within the reach. And honestly, it changed my whole thinking because mm. when I met Tal Jeb, I had more of a I guess junior operator mindset where I was being very reactive and I made absolutely no time for uh, proactive work for strategy thinking. And that one conversation, I think, turned my life around uh, as an operations person. So I think you could have many mentors in your life, but you know, sometimes one of them will tell you something that will leave a huge, huge impact uh, and, and really help you reframe how you think about yourself um, mm -hmm. as an operator. So, Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's to say, oh, and another thing with Operations Nation, we have a mentorship program called Mentor Stories where people mm. can more formally mentor one another. So uh, again, it's been beautiful to see so many operations people growing and helping one another yeah. grow more. It's how you learn anything, right, is being mentored by someone. Obviously, you can go and learn on your own. But if you're hearing this episode and you're hearing us talk about this and you're like, oh, man, I really want to be mentored. <laughs> there is obviously this program here to help you. I would also say, how could you potentially mentor a peer and how could a peer mentor you? Just like you were talking about, it's good to have somebody like I love talking to people in marketing because I know nothing about marketing and it really helps me learn that part of business and industry and vice versa too. So there's all of these opportunities to sort of grow your way of seeing things, your aperture, right? And that can be by other operators. It could be in people who are in you know different roles as you. But I think giving back and asking questions is ultimately probably the most valuable skills that you can have and the most fulfilling. 
um, if you can can get there. So let's get to know you with some rapid fire questions before we wrap up this episode. I know I saw your face. It's a little nervous. It's okay though. They're all <laughs> chill questions. <laughs> So first one is, what is the favorite part of your day? Ah, this is not, no such a rapid fire question. (laughs) It's a very, (laughs) very, very difficult question. I love my mornings. Mm. If I manage to get up early and put in a couple of hours of work before everyone wakes up, that is probably my most favorite part of the day where I have some space to think about what to prioritize and yeah just to be efficient before all the meetings kick in totally well i find that i've become a morning person too and it's a special part of the day and that's all i'm going to say um so i agree with you what book are you currently reading or what audiobook are you currently listening to uh i am currently audio listening to a book called make time mm. um Unfortunately, I am only two minutes in, so I'm not making time for it yet. Um, it oh, is the irony. <laughs> the irony. It is the irony, but it is an incredible book about how to, you know, not necessarily about how to be more efficient or how to uh, focus, but how about shift your thinking that so that you find a little bit more time for the most important things. So mm. I'm hopeful that I'm going to be learning a lot from it. My colleagues Amazing. loved it. So I'm, yeah. I'm putting that on the list too now. Um, what is the best purchase you've made under $50? Yeah, well, can, I, can it be a subscription? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, my gosh, this, absolutely. This, this, is, this is like $20, $20 a month actually. So, you know, it's like 20 yeah, $20 a month. I use a tool called Boomerang um, and it's a oh, yeah. plugin. Yeah, you use it too? I have used it in the past for the, is it, this is for the emails, right? This is for the emails and yes. it is the absolute best and I never miss anything and it keeps me on top of my inbox. Although sometimes when I go on holiday, um, that um, is a problem, but <laughs> it's been, I probably spent thousands for Boomerang over the last, I don't know, eight years, but it's literally the tool that I could not live with and it's worth every penny so love it hopefully you can insert it love it what is your favorite quote so i have a favorite quote but it's it is in lithuanian and i'm not entirely sure how to translate it um it is a quote by marcus aurelius and it reads like is your cucumber bitter throw it away are there briars in your path turn aside and it's as simple as that. Mm. Let me know if you need an explanation for that. <laughs> it's saying like the glass is half full, even if it doesn't look that way, maybe. Um, I think it's more about, uh, so I think it could be interpreted like that as well. Um, but um, but I think it's more about, you know, if you if you come to an obstacle in your life, you don't have to necessarily fight it. Kind of like pick your battles. Mm. Um So yeah, it's a little bit about prioritization. It's a little bit about giving yourself um, a time that is a little bit easier on you. You know, you don't have to fight every person that you meet, not, you know, like everything that you think is, is, um, is there coming at you. Yeah. Um, And I think there are many different ways to interpret it. Um, I love your interpretation, actually. You know, I like glasses. yours more. Yeah. That makes more. That makes more sense to me too, because I think you just have to let things go. Sometimes, not everything yeah. is your business to to deal with. You can let it go. It's not always yeah. all about you. Um, yeah. The next one is: What is something that makes you little kid happy? Basically, seeing people being nice to each other. Totally. Uh, what's the most important lesson you've learned so far in your life? Yeah. If you don't ask, you don't get. That's a good one. Dad. I needed to hear that. Um, that that last... came really quickly for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Got it. Um, last question is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Maybe I can be an artist eventually, something that I do apparently have a degree for. <laughs> um, I think I think it is not... 
a role that I want to play, like a specific role. I think um, I want to be creative. I want to remain creative. I think corporations gives me a lot of space for that creativity. But I also think that it is a very intense job to do. So hopefully um, I can unleash that creativity somewhere else when I grow up um, and that. just keep switching. Definitely. So if people are listening to you and they're like, oh my gosh, I want to connect. I want to learn more from everything that she's doing. Where where should we point people? Where should they find you? They could just drop me a message on LinkedIn. I am always going to respond, um, if not sooner than later, but I will get back to everyone. If you can spell my name. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep it in the episode description and we'll also link to Operations Nation and the International Ops Festival page so that if you want to check out all of the yummy things that are happening, you got to uh, click away. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for jumping into the human side of operations, especially as someone who's walked the path for those who maybe are thinking about doing the path of operations. It just was really helpful to hear from a human perspective. Um, sometimes we're always thinking about efficiency and process and all of that, but ultimately it comes down to, you know, who are we as humans today and who do we want to be tomorrow and how do we get there? So thank you so much for your time and for all that you are doing for the community. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ariana. Really loved your questions. So insightful. I think I'm going to go away and think a little bit more about some <laughs> of them. Me too. Me too. But Thank you for your podcast um, and thank you for everything that you're doing to get operations out there so that we're not preaching to the choir, which is, you know, ourselves as operations leaders, but we are actually sending the message to everyone else as well. Yeah, of course. Um, listeners, thank you so much for listening to this episode of Secret Ops. Please make sure to follow us wherever you find your podcast. And again, check us out at secret-ops.com. See you next time.